Good evening, everybody. If the people in the back, if you would, move up to the front, if you want. If you're a, if you're a audience member, we'd like all the audience members in the front, if possible. Um, my name is Kenny Lee, and I'm the principal of Columbus North International School. And I'd like to welcome everybody who came out tonight to learn more about the different facility proposals that are, that are on the table. A um, quick, couple quick housekeeping items. Restrooms. If you exit, the main exit here, to the right is going to be the women's restroom. To the left, there's a staff restroom near the stairs. It's also handicap accessible. And then if you keep going, the men's restroom is on the left-hand side. So, Men's restroom left, women's right. And then the same thing with the second floor, if you go up to the library, same thing on the second floor, women's restroom to the right, men's restroom to the left. So without further ado, it is my privilege, pleasure, and honor to represent our interim superintendent, Dr. John Stanford. Thank you. Oh, cut that out. Cut that out. Well, thank you all very much for coming this evening. We really appreciate you taking the time out of your busy schedules to be a part of our process. Uh, it is very important to us as a district and as a part of the facilities task force to have an opportunity to hear from the community and to hear your feedback on these different uh, preliminary recommendations. So we very much appreciate you being here and your presence here is proof to us and proof to this community of the widespread passion and deep personal uh, commitment that you all have to our community, to our students, and to Columbus City Schools. In all of my years as a part of this district, I have learned that change and advancement in Columbus City Schools are always made stronger when the community's voices are a large part of the process. And that requires all community members to be a part, not just some community members. From the beginning of this process, the facilities task force has been community focused. We, our task force is a community-led task force that started back in the spring. It is a task force that is filled with volunteer members who represent different neighborhoods across our city. The task force represent different organizations that work directly with our students and families. It is a task force that represents the diversity of the people in our city. It represents our teachers and staff members within the school district. And these individuals, believe me, have not been shy about sharing their thoughts and opinions and ideas as a part of this process. At this time, I want to... Um, um, recognize our board members and acknowledge them. Unfortunately, they are not uh, uh, available to be with us tonight because they have a special meeting that they are uh, participating in, uh, but they, they definitely send their greetings and, um, and their uh, thanks for being a part of this process. I also don't see the co-chairs of the task force, and I don't have my glasses on, so if uh, Perry Sabaty and Jim Negron are in the audience. Please stand up and be acknowledged by the audience. Nope, they're not here. Are there any other members of the, well, I know we got one at least. <laughs> are, if, if there are other members of the task force that are here, please stand up and be recognized by the audience. We also have a team of administrators and staff members who have been working uh, to facilitate the process. That, uh, that team was led by Maria Stockard, our Chief of Staff, and Alex Trevino, our Director of Capital Improvements. I don't see them in the room, and so they are probably uh, setting up the next portion of the event after we receive the presentation from Mr. Varner. Um, but the members of that internal group have worked very, very hard to provide the information, to provide the analysis uh, to the members of the task force so that they 
could do their job in a timely and effective manner. Since April of this year, the members of our facilities task force have examined data and information about all 110 schools in our district. Every school building in the district was reviewed and every administrative building in the district was reviewed. In each of our buildings, our team looked at both the challenges and opportunities that present a range of building issues such as the condition of the building, the capacity of the building, student enrollment in the building, and also transfer rates in and out of the attendance zones for that building. By the end of tonight's presentation, I hope you will appreciate that our process has been data-driven, data-informed, and very respectful of the diversity and the change challenges that face our district. Our task force members and our district leaders are here tonight with open minds and a willingness to have a constructive conversation with you all so that you can understand the, recommendation, the preliminary recommendations, but also ask questions and provide your own ideas and thoughts. Staff members from the district will be capturing your feedback throughout the evening to share with the task force at their meeting in October. If you are not able to share your thoughts tonight because you may be a little shy or you may not get the chance, um, we do have venues available online uh, that Mr. Scott Varner will talk about as a part of his presentation. We also have the ability for you to call in and share your thoughts and you can always use the old traditional snail mail as well. Many of your voices were a part of a similar process two years ago. That process was our facilities master plan update process. If you're not familiar, the, the facilities master plan is the blueprint for the district's future construction and renovation of school buildings across the district. Tonight's process is not a duplication of that process. Tonight we are here uh, not to talk about the construction of new buildings. That future conversation about the construction and renovation of new buildings will need to be a much larger discussion and will require the voices of the community and the voters to approve another large bond package in order for us to move forward with that plan. Tonight, we are here to look at how best we use the, the buildings that are currently in our portfolio, and we have to answer the question, how do we ensure that the use of our buildings is not a limitation on the academic offerings of our students who deserve to have the best opportunities at an education. I think we all agree that students come first, but I also know that there is always an emotional component when proposals such as the preliminary recommendations create any kind of change that we must consider. Rightfully so, because conversations of this magnitude, when we are considering the closure or historic change of a school should never be taken lightly. And again, that's why your presence here tonight is very appreciated. As you are sharing your thoughts tonight, I would ask three things of each of you. First, we are not here to debate and rehash past decisions because, quite frankly, there is no way for us to turn back the clock and make those decisions and turn back those decisions. So we ask that you, take, that you stay focused on the, the information and the data that we present to you this evening so that we can stay focused. Second, we want to embrace our history and the legacies of our schools. But please, please understand that the history and our great legacy in our communities cannot prevent us from considering change and making the hard decisions in order to move forward. Third, please do not discount the ability of our students, their grit, and their uh, ability to adapt to the changes that may come forward as a result of these recommendations. And then fourth, and most importantly, I would ask 
that you continue to have an open mind about this uh, set of proposals and have an open mind about this process. Understand that we are here to make decisions that are going to not only impact the students directly involved in the uh, recommendations, but these decisions also will have an impact on all 52,000 students across this district and also with all of the citizens across our great city. As I've said before, changes in Columbus City Schools are always made stronger when the community's voices are a part of the process. So we look forward to hearing your thoughts and ideas tonight. And with that, I will welcome Mr. Scott Varner, our Executive Director for Communications, to come up and give you the next portion of tonight's uh, meeting, which is the presentation. Well, good evening, everybody. First off, I want to make sure everyone can hear fine, because we're leaving the fans on because it's just a little bit warm. That's why I left my jacket off. Um, making sure you can hear fine. But if for some reason you can't hear or something you see on the slides, you want to take a closer look, if you have the Columbus City Schools app on your phone, if you have the Columbus City Schools mobile app on your phone, there's a button on there. You can actually follow along with this presentation. You can download the PDF so you can follow along. So if there's something you see on here that you want to go back to, just make sure you have the Columbus City Schools mobile app. As the head of communications for the district, part of my job in working um, with the task force has helped to facilitate some of the meetings. But tonight, my biggest job is to take the work that has gone on since April and condense it down to about 20 minutes. So if you'll give me just about 20 minutes, I'm gonna to try to explain all that the task force has done since April and kind of go through the recommendations, including the one that probably has brought most of you here tonight. So let me make sure my... So as Dr. Stanford mentioned, this community-led task force, these individuals that represent many parts of our community, um, were supported by members of the staff, and together we looked at some of the national best practices, local history, and really that subject matter experience that many of us bring to the table, so that this task force could really look through data, make recommendations, recommendations that were based upon um, rationale by policy that's set by the board, looking at a number of different factors with the goal of making sure that they had their final recommendations by October. So what we're talking about tonight are just draft recommendations, there first. And to give you a better sense of what this calendar has looked like, you can see they started in April, have had a series of meetings that gets us to September. September is the month that we've, they've dedicated to hearing as much public comment as possible. So in addition to these public meetings, we've been meeting with students. We were here this morning meeting with a number of the students that might be impacted by this. There's a lot of ways in which they're collecting public comment during this month with the goal of making sure by October they can do their final recommendations, get those before the board in November. And the reason we have this timeline is because, as many as you know, in January is when we open the school lottery. And we want to make sure that our families, before they enter that school lottery, have a best sense of what might be happening to our schools. And so that's the reason for this thorough timeline, but why we need to try to get this done um, in the time that we do. So let me kind of go through the process that this task force looked at. So as the task force started, their first two priorities as they looked at our building was to make sure that the use of our buildings were a benefit to our students. In other words, was there anything about the buildings themselves, the way we use them, that hindered our students' academic opportunities? At the same time, then they asked, are we using our buildings as efficiently and effectively as possible? Do we have buildings that are half empty? Do we have buildings that are overcrowded? We want to make sure that the resources that we've been given, we are using them as most efficiently and effectively as possible, and then making sure that that is a benefit to our students and their academic opportunities. So with that, the task force started breaking things down. They looked at sheer numbers, 
data. They want to know a lot of numbers. They want to look at some of the qualitative elements of these buildings. What are some of the programming issues? And then third, they want to know about impact. If they made a decision to close or change boundaries or to merge, they had to look at what that potential impact might be. What's it going to mean to the, the students that are in that school, to the families, to the community, to other schools that would have to also adjust? Let me go through even some of the specifics. So when we talk about data, they looked at everything from student enrollment. How many students are enrolled in each of our 110 schools? Then in each of those 110 schools, they looked at square footage and the number of classrooms and compared the two. How are we using our buildings? What's the utilization? Are we under capacity or over capacity? They looked at the condition of the buildings. Are they older buildings? Have they been new and replaced? Are they receiving some of the bond dollars that voters approved back in 2016 to allow us to do major repairs? Do they have air conditioning? Questions about the conditions of the building. And then finally, they, numbers-wise, they looked at transfer rates. You know what that is. That's where we look at the number of families that live in a neighborhood, and then how many of the students there choose to transfer to a building out of their neighborhood, or maybe number that transfer into the neighborhood who choose to come in as part of their school choice. So those are the numbers, the quantitative data they looked at, but then they moved to looking at qualitative data. Everything from the educational programming. If it's a STEM school, is that STEM program being offered with fidelity? They looked at safe access. Are there sidewalks and roadways that make it safe for students to get to school? What about accessibility? We also even pulled in uh, our partners over at Morpsey to look at neighborhood trends. Where are the parts of Columbus where we're expecting to see more families moving into, families with school-aged children moving into? Um, grade band design. As part of the facilities master plan um, that Dr. Stanford mentioned, we heard from the community this desire to see a return to more of our traditional grade band designs. That's where you have kindergarten through fifth grade and elementary, or where possible pre-kindergarten in there too. And then a true middle school experience, six, seven, and eight in middle school together. And then separate, a true high school experience, nine, 10, 11, 12. And returning to, across our district, we have some combinations of that. And what we heard from the community, they wanted to see more of a return to that traditional grade banding. They even looked at everything down to the number of work orders. How many times have we sent a repair guy out to our different buildings? And then finally, in terms of impact, they wanted to look at just what would be the impact. If you closed a school, would you be able to really relocate the students somewhere else? What would be the impact or burden um, on a school? Would they be able to accommodate those students? How much would we interrupt feeder patterns? So at, since April, the task force looked at all of that data, they looked at all, all 110 schools, and they came up with six, six recommendations that impact about three dozen of our buildings across the district. I'm going to walk you through those recommendations just so you have the information. I'm not here to try to convince you one way or the other. I just want to make sure that everybody has the same data and information that our task force heard so that you understand their recommendations. Because in a few minutes when we have you go to our breakout sessions, I want all of us to have that same information that we all are kind of playing from the, the same set of facts. So let me run through these and hopefully they'll make sense. So the first recommendation involves three of our elementary schools out on the west side. Highland Elementary, West Broad Elementary, and Westgate Elementary. The issue here is looking at attendance and the number of students, that capacity issue. West Broad being a building that was reaching um, near or above their capacity. We also had a safe access issue, uh, West Broad Street being a very busy street. So we looked at a way of how could we adjust the attendance in those three schools so that we balance that out, balance out attendance and provide some safer access. So the proposal here is to simply redraw some of the attendance boundaries. Let me move to the map because this will make it really easy to understand. If you see this is West Broad Street that runs right along here, very busy roadway. Currently, if you live south of West Broad Street in these areas, you have to cross the street to go to West Broad Elementary. Our recommendation, or the, excuse me, the task force, their recommendation is to take these two pockets if you lived here, you instead would go to Highland Elementary, 
a building that's actually received some additional funding thanks to the levy. They now have air conditioning. And if you live in this pocket, which is on the other side of Hague Avenue, and again, another busy street, you would actually go to Westgate. So by redrawing these attendance boundaries, you start to balance out the enrollment across all three schools. In some cases, we're able to better utilize a building that's had major repair investments. Just real quick, by show of hands, is there anybody here from the west side or is interested in hearing more about this issue? That one's pretty simple, so I think a lot of folks understand that one. Let me show you another one that's very simple in, in terms of the recommendation. This is looking at North Linden Elementary and Mays Elementary. Again, North Linden is an elementary where it was over capacity. We had extra students than the building can allow for, and Mays Elementary has a little, is under capacity, there's space. And so again, the task force is recommending that you kind of even out the attendance boundaries. In this case, we actually have over at North Linden, there's um, a pretty significant English as a second language unit that is working with our students that are still learning English language, um, are many of our new American families. Probably when we do this split, we would have to add a new unit as well over at Mays. But that's a good thing because then we're better serving our ESL populations in both areas. So again, let me just show you the map. If you look, we're talking about this little attendance boundary area right here. This one's empty because that's where the uh, old Northland Mall used to be. There aren't too many families that live at Menards. Um, but it's the families that live in this little pocket that under this proposal, if right now you go to North Linden, but now if you move there, we would actually have you go to Mays Elementary. So if you're currently living there, under this proposal, you would instead go to Mays Elementary starting next year. Again, a pretty simple one. Is there anybody here connected to either of those schools that needs to hear more about that? No? Okay. Perfect. Let me start getting to those that are a little more complicated, and there's a lot more moving parts. I'm first going to start by looking over at our east side schools. So here we have... Um, East High School and Lyndon McKinley STEM Academy. East High School being a building that is under capacity. I think their current utilization rate's about 51%. That means there's a lot of empty space in that building. We look at Lyndon McKinley, um, their utilization rate is about 75%. It's also one of those seven through 12 buildings. So again, as we talk about trying to get back to more traditional grade banding. So the proposal in this part of town is that the proposal is to turn Lyndon McKinley into a middle school. So we change it from a high school into a middle school. We take the high school grades out of Lyndon McKinley and we put those into East. So now if you were moving up through those feeder patterns, instead of going to Lyndon McKinley High School, you would instead go to East High School. You would come through this new Lyndon McKinley Middle School. It's a school that already had 7th and 8th graders. We would also look at all of the elementary schools that currently feed into it in the, on the south side. A lot of our south side elementaries are those K-6s. Again, 6th graders that are kind of still in elementary, and we want to give them that true middle school experience. So we would take all of those 6th graders out of those K-6s and put them in the new Lyndon McKinley Middle School. We also have a couple of, of those ESL units I was talking about um, at nearby Mifflin Middle School and Medina Middle School. And we would actually pull those units out of those two middle schools and again, put them in this new Lyndon McKinley Middle School. It's a, brand, it's a, it's a renovated building with a lot of nice new space um, that would better serve those ESL students. Let me start to show you some of the, the map. And when we do that, by pulling some of those classes out of Mifflin and Medina Middle Schools, we actually can combine them and close one of those buildings. So we would actually close Mifflin Middle School. Why do you do it? Well, what the task force said, by making those changes, you start to fully utilize buildings. East High School now has two middle schools that would be feeding into it. Lyndon McKinley would be a dedicated middle school that would have a number of schools feeding into it. Academics. Whenever we have larger student body populations, we are actually able to offer more academic programming. 
I mean, think about it. If in a smaller high school, if you have two or three students who maybe are interested in a specialized program or class, it's kind of hard for the school to invest a teacher uh, or dedicate a person for just one or two students. But suddenly, if it's a much larger student body, instead of two or three students, there's probably 10 or 20. And once you get to that more students, then you can look at more academic programming. You can look at more extracurricular offerings. As we talk about that grade banding, again, giving students that true middle school experience, instead of having young people, sixth graders still in elementary, instead of having seventh and eighth graders being put into high school, we had, uh, with that new Linda McKinley Middle School, we were able to create that true middle school experience. I already mentioned some of the improved ESL space. Combining both Mifflin and Medina, again, allows for us to bring students together for a larger student body, gives that true middle school experience. And here's one of the other points, too. We know that buildings and neighborhoods are often points of pride. Whether they're a high school or a middle school, there's a great sense of pride around that high school that many folks have went to, a middle school. And so by maintaining the buildings, even though we're changing Linda McKinley to a middle school, we still maintain the Linda McKinley building and still give that community a point of pride. We thought that was important. One thing we did note on this is this is going to be something that will take a little bit longer because right now East High School is part of the uh, Ohio State University, their Health Sciences Academies. It's a great program getting a lot of attention. Linda McKinley is getting a lot of attention for its STEM programming. So we need a little bit of time to kind of rework the curriculum so those both can come together. So that would actually be a two-year implementation. Most of what we talk about are in one year. This would probably be two years. So real quick, this just kind of shows you how everything would work. So now East High School would have two feeder patterns that feed right into it, two middle schools. This just shows you the map. So if you live anywhere in these sections, your high school would become East High School. This just shows, again, once we move some students out of Mifflin Middle and Medina Middle, we can actually combine both of these buildings and move everybody into Medina Middle School and close down Mifflin Middle School again, which is one of our older buildings, no air conditioning. This was a pretty big topic the other day when we were at Linda McKinley, but is there anybody here tonight that wants to, is here to talk more about Linda McKinley? Great, thank you. Hopefully you got your ticket out front to show you where that room was. Perfect, thank you. All right, let's move on to another one, very similar to this. This is looking at our South Side schools, um, looking at Marion Franklin High School and South High School. Very similar proposals, very similar concerns. Marion Franklin being a building that is underutilized. How do we better utilize it? South being a school that is one of those 712 buildings. How do we restore those traditional grade bands? So the proposal here is very similar in that we convert Marion Franklin High School into Marion Franklin Middle School. We convert it to the middle school. So we take the 9th through 12th grades that are currently in Marion Franklin, we move those um, into South High School. At South High School, we take the 7th and 8th graders that are currently there and move them into this new Marion Franklin Middle School, again, getting them more of that middle school experience. Also down there is Buckeye Middle School. We would actually take all of the students out of Buckeye Middle School, put them into this new Marion Franklin Middle School, and close Buckeye Middle School. We would actually close that building. Again, an older building, no air conditioning. Marion Franklin is an older building, but it has air conditioning. Just got it this year thanks to Operation Fix It, those bond repair dollars. Also in that neighborhood, again, in the south side, we have a number of schools that are those K-6 programs. We would take those sixth graders out, no longer, sixth graders in elementary. They would go to this new Marion Franklin Middle School. By doing that, that gives us some extra space at those elementaries where when the money's available, we can add pre-K. But at the same time, it gives us a little more room to address some of the other non-academic barriers that our students may face. So why do we do it? Again, it's about utilization. How do we better utilize the, a building that's half empty at Marion Franklin? Their utilization rate is currently 53%. We would now have nine elementary schools, nine elementary schools feeding into that building, into this new Marion Franklin Middle School. 
It allows us to restore that grade banding that we talked about, getting away from having middle school students either treated like high schoolers too early or staying in elementary too long. You also create some bigger class sizes. I don't mean in the classroom, I mean the, the, the class of 2023 is now much larger and when there's more students within a, uh, within a building that allows us to offer more academic programming. I talked about it's an improved structure there at Marion Franklin. The elementary space allows us to expand the programming at our elementaries. Um, it also allows us to, you know, take when we take those sixth graders out of that building, again, giving them that middle school experience, as we talked about, opportunities for pre-K. As you know, right now, this, across the city, we're looking for more opportunities when funding's made available, either through the city or through the state, to offer more pre-K, and we think that's pretty important. Now, I will say this as part of this plan. One of the areas that we have down there, we have an elementary, Siebert Elementary is one of our older South Side elementaries. When we move all of the sixth graders out of the other elementaries in that area, we can actually take the student body that's currently in Siebert and move those into two other buildings that allows us to close Siebert, to close a building that is an older building, putting those students in newer buildings at Stewart Elementary and Southwood Elementary. The other thing we do, again, by maintaining Marion Franklin as a building, even though it's a middle school, we still retain that point of pride on the south side, and then we still have South High School as the point of pride for our south team. Here's a look at kind of the map, as well as what that feeder pattern looks like. We had a pretty big turnout at Marion Franklin earlier this week for this, but is there anybody here for this proposal to learn more about it? Perfect. Well, let me move on to the proposal I think that has brought most of you here. And that is, as we look to the use of this building, how do we best utilize this building and how do we address concerns at Dominion Middle School? So this proposal impacts not only Columbus North International, it affects the Columbus Global Academy, which is located down at the old Brookhaven High School. It impacts Dominion Middle School, but it also impacts our Columbus French Immersion School. Uh, it impacts our Columbus Spanish Immersion School, and it also impacts Hubbard Mastery. So here's what this proposal says. This proposal is kind of a two-parter. It begins with taking the high school students out of this building. So we take the North High School program, grades 9 through 12, and we relocate that to the former Brookhaven site. We allow it to co-locate with the Columbus Global Academy. Now, if you're not familiar with what Columbus Global Academy is, again, that's for many of our new American families. Students start their time there as they're learning intensive English language classes, as well as able to continue on in their normal coursework. Whenever a student is done at the Global Academy, they usually return to their home school, but we would actually reserve a spot for them at this new Columbus International High School at Brookhaven. So we would co-locate co the high school class that's currently in here, 9 through 12, and move them to the former Brookhaven site to co-locate with the Columbus Global Academy. The second part of this proposal is then what we do with this great building. And the proposal there is then to take the student body population out of Dominion Middle School all of the students out of Dominion Middle School and move them here to join the 7th and 8th graders that are currently here. Create a new Dominion North Middle School. We'd have to figure out the name later, but create this new Dominion North Middle School. At the same time though, the task force really took this a step further. What the recommendation also says is that we look at our immersion programs. Where currently those are, again, our K-6 programs, <clears throat> excuse me, or in some cases pre-K to six, we take those sixth graders and move them over here. But not simply move them, actually work with the Dominion community to revamp their programming, their academic offerings, so that we can create a language immersion program as part of Dominion. Dominion currently is working on a STEAM uh, curriculum, which if STEAM is STEM with arts, um, that's a great program. And adding to that would be this immersion program so that our young people who are going through 
our language immersion programs, or working through Hubbard, would now have a dedicated middle school where they know they could go to. <clears throat> For those of you that are connected to those two schools, I think you know that one of our challenges is often our, we have a lot of students that leave after fifth grade because they want to get into you know, that middle school experience. So this would be a way for us to put them into a true middle school experience and allow them to continue their immersion programming. Again, so why do we do this? Well, the first part of it, again, is utilization. How do we make sure that we are best utilizing the buildings that we have by moving the student body from here down to Brookhaven, co-locating with that Columbus Global Academy where we're best utilizing that Brookhaven spot. There was a lot of community support as part of that facilities master plan process, the same that said we should go back to traditional gray banding. They too thought that the idea of co-locating Columbus Global Academy and North International would be um, a great idea. Not that the two schools offer the same programming, but they really coexist together well. It allows us to get back to that traditional grade banding. When we talk about the moving Dominion over here, if you have a, a student in Dominion, I don't have to tell you that is a building that is over capacity. I think the current capacity level is 120%. We know that that's a full building. So by moving to this building, you suddenly have a lot more space. In fact, a lot more space which is why the re-envisioning of adding in those other programs really helps fill this space. This is an improved structure. So this building has received about a million point eight um, uh, in funding over the last two years. Um, no, it does not have air conditioning, um, but it has received a number of improvements across the building. Again, when you start to combine schools, when you start to build up the student body, you're allowed to expand academic programming. And think of this new program, the STEAM combined with the language immersion. It's like nothing we've seen in this district before, and I think it could be um, a great opportunity to kind of re-envision uh, what that programming might look like. We've talked about the train start to kind of diminish that transfer issue that we see out of our immersion programs. And by moving sixth graders out, that might actually allow us to take some of the wait list, uh, address some of those wait lists at some of our immersion programs, because now you might have some additional space in those new buildings. Finally, it's about that true middle school experience. I want to show you the map real quick, because I think it's important to note why, why these things work well. If you look, here's where we're at tonight at International High School. Here's where Dominion is currently located. You see that we stay within the Dominion neighborhood. That's what this purple area represents. That's the neighborhood that serves Dominion Middle School. Here's the former Brookhaven site. So we'd be moving International to this Brookhaven site. The red dots over here represent International students. So you see that we stay right within where many of our international students currently go. The other thing here is that um, our, our guys that do the map are pretty fancy. They looked at where all of the students currently live at Dominion and found the geographic center, so the middle point where every student lives, and the middle point is right here. So we're not actually moving too far from the middle by moving students to this building. I don't even know if I need to do the show of hands. I think everybody here is probably here for, for this programming. Um, I, I don't have that number off the top, and, and we'll, we'll make sure to share that with you at the breakout groups. We'll have all of those numbers. The task force did also look at some of our administrative buildings. They had recommendations for 10 of those. If that's something that you're interested in, just if you would hang um, right after we're done here. I, I want to get you into your breakout session so we spend as much time as possible capturing your voice. As Dr. Stanford shared, we are going to spend this entire month of September making sure that we are collecting as much community feedback as possible. This is the third of our community meetings. It's my understanding that our Board of Education would actually like to see a few more, so we'll be announcing those sometime soon. But if for some reason there's something you didn't think about tonight, there's a neighbor that couldn't be here, other family members, make sure to go online. You can go onto our website, you can go onto our mobile app, you can even call our customer relations helpline. We've set up a special email address, this talk to us at columbus.k12.oh, and as Dr. Stanford mentioned, 
if you're still old school and want to send a, a letter. So in just a second, I'm going to have you go into those breakout rooms. And the reason we do this isn't necessarily to break groups up, but it's to make sure that we capture every voice. If you remember sometimes those old community meetings where you had a microphone and only five or six people got to talk, you didn't get to capture every voice. This way, we're able to capture every voice. We want to make sure that we are writing down everything you say because what our plan is, is to take all of those comments, every single one, and make sure that the members of our task force get to see them. Our plan is to present that task force with a huge packet of all of the comments that have been received, whether it's through email, through talking with students, through hearing your voices, and make sure that they see all of them. Not just hearing it secondhand, not just a recording, but actually on a piece of paper that says what your concerns are. There are three questions that when you're at your table, I'd ask that you think about. The first question is, to your point, is there something about the recommendation that you didn't understand? I know I kind of went through things quickly, um, and I've done this enough where sometimes I forget to say something. So if there's something about the recommendation that I presented that you don't understand, make sure to ask um, the person at your table. They will also have some of the data that folks ask, like what the specific capacity is at a building. The second question that we would ask you to think about is what's additional information? What's something that the task force didn't know or should know? I kind of went through all the data sets that there were that they looked at, but is there something else, something that should have been up there that you didn't see? Make sure you share that, because if there's some additional information they should know, we want to make sure the task force has it. And finally, you've heard these six recommendations, but maybe you have another idea. What's another idea? But it's not just a, an idea about, well, we should just build all new buildings, because as Dr. Stanford shared, that's something that's going to take a much larger conversation, uh, a vote uh, for a new bond levy. But what are some other ideas that would still allow us to address those issues of overcapacity, of making sure our buildings are the best benefit possible to our students and to their academic offerings? If you have other ideas, make sure you share them, because what's most important about these recommendations is they're just that. They're recommendations right now. Nothing is final. Nothing has been decided. And we know that in Columbus City Schools, as Dr. Stanford said, I hate to keep repeating you, but these are good words, that our voices, our decisions are always stronger when there's everyone there, when every voice is heard. There's our website. So when you came in, when you registered, I think you were given a ticket as to which room to start in, to start in. And again, we're simply doing that just so we capture your voices. But after you start in that location, feel free to move to other rooms. Feel free to move and make sure other people are hearing what you have to say, that you're listening to what others are saying. So with that, I appreciate you being here, and we look forward to hearing your voices in those rooms. Thank you.